Welcome back to Your Health Radio and Television Program uh, on AM Radio Station 1240 KNRY, local uh, public access cable channel 24, and streaming online at www.ampmedia.org. So this hour we've been discussing oral health and dental hygiene as October is National Dental Hygiene Awareness Month. Earlier we spoke um, with a pediatric dentist about some of the things that are recommended for parents to, to do regularly in, in terms of going to the dentist, regular checkups, um, having their child attend uh, their first dental appointment after one year old or the first tooth. And as well, we heard from a, a gentle, excuse me, general dentistry practitioner as well as an orthodontist um, about some of the new technologies and developments in orthodontic procedures and general dentistry procedures and some of the cosmetic um, practices that are coming uh, to be more popular these days. So now we'll hear from my next guest, Ms. Debbie Diaz of Community Oral Health Services about accessing dental care and some of the oral health services available in our community. Debbie, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Indeed. What is it, like the third or fourth appearance you've, you've it's had? It's the fourth, believe it or not. Wow. I really appreciate it. I think you're the you know, <clears throat> most frequent guest we've had. Well, we have a great community of experts out there. I'm just trying to do the best that I can to help them access the children that we have in our community that need help. Indeed, and you're doing a great job of it. Thank you. Thank you. So um, tell us a little bit about Community Oral Health Services. Well, Community Oral Health Services is a nonprofit organization formerly called the Apollonia Foundation. It was formed essentially by a group of community dentists, um, such as uh, doctors that are affiliated with the Monterey Bay Dental Society and Central Coast Pediatric Dental Group and the health department many years ago to access, originally to access um, children in South Monterey County. Ten years ago when the organization was formed, there was very limited services and uh, transportation was a huge is issue. Since then, um, the organization has changed their name, expanded a little bit, and our new name or, since 2006 is Community Oral Health Services. But the ultimate goal is really to connect families and children with the dental home and provide emergency access and comprehensive prevention services to those that might have an issue that couldn't access a traditional dental home. Sure, that sounds great. Lord knows there's plenty of of you know access issues in Monterey County, it, it's you know pretty big. There's we've got a, a you know a radius to cover, and the economy right now is not helping the dentist. Definitely, it's really it a little more difficult for many, and and it difficult for many to to access services because services like transportation and whatnot have been exactly kind of terminated or, or cut back. So what areas um, you have a mobile dental clinic? We do. We have. Two, actually. Two of them. Mm -hmm. And what areas of the county, you mentioned South County, what other um, areas, if need, do they serve and what kind of hours or how do you? Well, we try to, st we, we've, it's taken us quite a few years to get pretty um, precise at how we do this. And we've really teamed up with the Family Resource Centers in Monterey County. So there's a Family Resource Center in um, Alisal, out in East Salinas by Alisal High School at the Alisal um, Healthy Start Program. There's a Family Resource Center, it's in Seaside, and, um, and then we house our bigger mobile, our older mobile, at the Greenfield Elementary School. So years ago, um, well, actually a year ago, we had three mobiles, and we had two dental teams, and we kind of rotated around the whole county. We went, we went as far as San Ardo to Seaside, but with the economic situation, we've pared down a little bit. As a matter of fact, we're currently looking at our sites as they are now, um, Central Coast Pediatric Dental Group now has an office in Seaside that, that accepts uh, Medi-Cal and healthy families. So our whole mission of our organization is about access. So we're finding that families are accessing services in an area that we're at. So we're kind of um, strategically looking at areas that are underserved that we can help out and, um, and move to that area. So, so you have to be um, fill out, out an application for healthy families? Well, or um, all families are welcome to come to our to the mobile facilities, but during those visits at the mobile facilities, we go through a series of um, education um, processes to try to get families into regular dental homes. So, if you came to us with your young child, for example, and he or she had insurance, um, not that we wouldn't certainly want to see a family that had insurance, but if they had 
no other issues, if they could drive to a dental office or if we would really encourage them to find a dental home. And the reason behind that is a nonprofit. You don't want to enable families. If you can connect them to a long-term um, health management system, you really want to do that. But if you know that this is all that they're going to get, we provide the highest quality of services for those families. So they get the same quality of care but we really try to work with the community and the other dentists. Very good. It sounds like you are very well networked as well with, with some of the other um, you know, dentists and practitioners that have been on the program today and then others um, you know, out in the community because Monterey Bay Dental Society is, as you said, and, and the P uh, Central Coast Pediatric Dental Group, a very large pool of, of dentists and locations for folks to access those services. Well, and Dr. Uh, Morris's practice is pretty much in the trenches with us every day. They're, they're working with uh, Medi-Cal patients, healthy families patients, along with their private patient flow. Dr. Osaki and, and several dentists in the Dental Society also do volunteer days. Um, throughout the year, we do get, we've done Give Kids a Smile Day. They're, they're out there. They're rolling up their sleeves, and they're doing a great job as well. We had an instance, um, especially with the economy, things are, are parents really need to keep an eye on their children and take a look in their mouths. We had a little boy that was two years old um, last month. I got a call from one of the local hospitals, the pediatric department. He was on two days IV antibiotics from a severe dental infection. So we're talking, and when Dr. Morris says that this can be life-threatening, he really means that this can be life-threatening. Uh, fortunately, you know, well, they, they came to us. We were able to get them connected to um, Healthy Families or Medi-Cal. I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what it was. The parents were referred over to Central Coast. Chad was completely taken care of and now is doing very well in school. That's so, amazing. I yeah. thank you so much for, for that connection and, and kind of giving us an example of, you know, life-threatening is life-threatening. And I, that, that was a serious case. And it's, it's great to hear that story have an, uh, a happy ending, too. It was nice. The mother... Was a young teen mom, single mom, and she just, she just said, "I just didn't know. I just did not know." And that's really what community oral health services is all about: is getting the message out there, getting the word of the connection between oral health and a child's ability to learn, and essentially one's overall oral health. A pregnant woman that has severe periodontal disease, for example. Um, puts a baby, her unborn baby, at a high risk for preterm delivery and low birth weight babies. So we're already starting behind the curve if we don't have a healthy mouth when we're carrying our young children. So oral health really is a matter of starting very, very early. That's amazing. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not what folks think when they think, um, at least for my opinion, it's not what folks think when they think of oral health, going to the dentist, no, they think regular checkups, the drill, I don't know, braces, but not, oh my goodness, this could really set up, you know, one's life for, for much greater health and, and you know, right. free of complications. And families of, uh, that are struggling, I mean, I, I, if you have insurance and you've gone to the dentist, you know that it's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have no insurance, you can only imagine how expensive it might be. There's a lot involved in providing dentistry. That's why it's so expensive. So if we can get parents in at an early age and we can prevent dental disease, we can save families a lot of money over a lifetime. That's amazing. That's um how does well? How does one make an appointment? So how so? How do we save money? How do we start saving money? How do we? You well, know? they can call our office. Um, do you want me to say the number? Oh, please it's, do. Um, uh, the area code eight three one four two two six eight eight nine, and um, any one of our care managers will um, ask them a few questions, find out if there's a potential to refer them to another office, or if we need to get them in with one of our resource workers to try to get them on Medi-Cal or Healthy Families. And we schedule an appointment, we do an evaluation. If we feel that there's um, an access issue, we can treat the child there in the facility where we're at on site. We rotate um, regularly, so we're in each location one week, if not two weeks out of the month um, on a consistent basis so families can tell their friends they're, they're coming back on the third week of such and such. Um, and it's as simple as that. That sounds like you really make it very flexible. You're very flexible and willing to work with 
you know, the communities and you're going to them and you're making everything as accessible as possible. That's amazing. Well, like Dr. Morris said, it's not always easy taking care of your child's teeth. We're just out there trying to give parents the tools and the knowledge to not feel guilty when their child's crying, to give them an idea that, you know, this is, this is something that it may not feel good for you right now, but it'll feel a lot better than if you have to sit out in the waiting room while your child is going, undergoing extensive dental care. Right, and I'm sure that is one of the barriers. Um, we were kind of mentioning this earlier in a previous segment, but that's well, you know, one of the barriers that parents experience when trying to um, access routine uh, dental care for their children is that you know, the, ch the child is not clearly enjoying maybe the experience, right. but you know, even though you know it's necessary, you know, you've got to do it, and, and despite if the child's going to be upset with you later on, what are, the, uh, what are some of the other uh, barriers that parents experience? Well, in our in our world, and, and transportation. Our, transportation is the, is a huge issue. Um, another another obstacle that we find with families is sometimes embarrassment. You know, parents don't have the skills or the tools or or they are to to, to do what they need to do, and they know that their children are in dental crisis, so they're afraid to come in. They're afraid they're going to get the lecture, or so we try to interact on a completely different kind of guilt-free level until we can get them acclimated into the into a, a realm that they need to to think about. Interesting approach. You okay. certainly don't want to I can see how uh, you know one would feel embarrassed if you know a reaction from someone that you know looked into you know your child's mouth was oh right. goodness what is that you know. Well I you know I raised two boys and of course I worked for a dentist so when I had to take mine to the dentist I, I knew that I didn't floss their teeth every night. I came home, I worked late, and you know, the thought of, oh my gosh, I hope they don't have a cavity. It's, it's very stressful for parents. But I, I think another obstacle that's really um, um, shameful, and not shameful to the parents, but shameful to us because we haven't been able to get the message out as, as well as I'd hoped we could, is a lot of parents think that baby teeth are dispensable. You know, I ha they, they think it's kind of a rite of passage. Well, when I was little, I had a toothache, it'll go away. It's like having a near ache. Mm -hmm. And um, as you've heard from the experts, it's critical that we keep those baby teeth in good condition to save space for orthodontic reasons, you know, um, for eating, for sleeping. I find um, when, we are, when we're in the preschool setting, when you go into a classroom and you have a child that has um, severely, severely decayed teeth, they tend to be a little more shy sitting at the back of the room. They know that they're just not um, right, that there's something just not right with them. And when they've had their dental work done, it's a completely different atmosphere. And they've done studies that say that when a child, um, when, when, when a child is not smiling, people don't smile back at that child. So if a child is kind of um, back in the background and the teacher is not interacting with them as much as they, they are with their peers, it could be very detrimental to the growth of their educational process. Potentially, yes, and that's, you know, Children have the ability to to recognize that something is not one hundred things are not one hundred percent, and and yes, that could. We mentioned earlier, Dr. Morse did mention, you know, you you need to treat the the cavities in baby teeth despite um, the fact they'll fall out for so many reasons. I'm glad you uh, mentioned that again. Thank you. So, does poor um, as you mentioned, poor poor oral health it looks like it does. Is, you could potentially severely affect uh, a child's um, ability to learn in school if they're feeling alienated or you know isolated from the others because of this. In addition, that um, dental disease is the number one reason for missed school days across the United States. Um, don't quote me on the numbers, but I think it's somewhere like 20 million hours of missed school time due to dental issues. And that doesn't take in the, the fact that the parents have to take off work and, and miss, miss you know, their earnings to get their child for emergency, not for preventative. This is, t we're talking emergency services. Wow. So then is it, is it sometimes, so we know we need to brush every day. So is it difficult then? Um, we don't want them to get to, to have a you know dental issue and and have them be out of school because they're gonna miss school we're gonna miss work so is it difficult to brush your child's teeth like after a meal or, or surgery or is there something we can do to help prevent cavities um, well one of the thing them. and dr. Morris said this too is, is frequent snacking you know when we work when we're working in public health especially with the obesity issue we're telling people to lose weight you eat small meals several throughout the day in dentistry we're saying 
be careful with those in, in between snacking because it's not just sugary drinks. It's not just apple juice and sodas. We're talking about fermentable carbohydrates like crackers, um, chips, things that most parents would not consider cavity causing. So if the parents are out and they're having, you know, they're at a soccer game or they're not able to brush their child's tooth, we know that that's not possible. But rinsing with water, swish and swallow, those are some good techniques. But every night before bed and in and, and the morning, um, teeth, baby teeth that are not touching together don't necessarily have to be flossed. But if they're touching together, they really need to be flossed to prevent um, inter, what we call interproximal, in, be, in between decay. So, so flossing, um, routine brushing, um, the let, you know monitor the sugar intake and the frequency of the sugar intake, as well as the as as the carbohydrates, the crackers, the chips that you mentioned, right. and and we want to wash in between um, eating these things. But after eating these things, um, just wash the mouth out, regardless exactly. if if there's well, essentially you like to brush, but wash the mouth out, and. Parents that have children on certain medications should check with their dentist. For example, some asthma medications dry up the saliva, and the saliva is a natural cleansing mechanism. So there are some medications that young children are on that could cause them to be at higher risk for dental disease. Well, excellent. This is, this is very timely news, especially given the Halloween kind Halloween, of festivities right. coming up here. Well, we, you know, we say you can't, I always use this as an example. When, when I had young children, at, when they were really young, I hid the candy from them only to find candy underneath their bed and in their closet. So I think if, you know, if you're gonna let your children have candy, in my opinion, this is not a professional opinion, I say let them have what they want, brush their teeth well and get rid of it. But that little, you know, as parents we always say, okay, you get a little bit tonight and then you get a little bit tomorrow. That's a little dangerous when it comes to carries. Because we don't wanna, you know, have them Get, eat all the candy at once and then just kind of be sitting there hoarding it. There's wrappers everywhere. <laughs> well, happy happy Halloween, everyone. Happy and Halloween. Um, thank you so much, Debbie, for being on the program. Um, I've certainly learned a lot, and I hope everyone else has. Uh, don't forget to join us each month on the third Monday. And next month's topic will be smoking and the many new and dangerous developments uh, local smokers face. Thanks so much, and see you next time. <laughs>